you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Tonight I want to speak to you tonight about living in the past. Living in the past. The outline, and there's papers back there if you wanted to get an outline to fill out. Number one, past earthly thing. Okay, past earthly thing. Number two, past personal righteousness. Past personal righteousness righteousness. And number three, past fears and failures. Past fears and failures. Father, be with us tonight as we look at the Word. And God, I thank you that your Word is always true. It is yes, and it's amen. And God, I just pray you be with this Bible study and just illuminate Scripture for us. And I thank you for our WANA program. Thank you for our Youth Disciple program. Thank you for our young couples that meet at this time also. And uh, God, we just thank you that we can come to church on a Wednesday night and just study your word. God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, uh, there are three stages in life, and, and the first stage uh, is the past. Okay, I mean, you know, as you go and we look back, it's the past. The second stage is the present. All right, the present. Today's the present. We're living in the present day. And the third stage is the future. And, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of crazy stuff going on right now, but our future is bright, folks. It is bright because of who we are and where we are going. Uh, I believe there are many people who live in the past. While we should learn from the past, the Bible teaches us that living in the past is not a good thing. Uh, not a good thing for a growing Christian. Let's look at our focal text to find out what God is trying to teach us through the Holy Spirit and the Apostle Paul's life. Let's look, let's look at past earthly things. Verse 7, Philippians 3, 7. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things a loss for the excellence of the knowledge of of Jesus Christ, my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things and have counted them as rubbish that I might gain Christ. And what happens uh, when we get saved? Our priorities should change. And Paul's, I mean, you think of his conversion experience in Acts chapter 9, okay? He was a, a persecutor of Christians. He was, you know, you know, uh, you know, you know, not living for uh, the the Lord, and and he just had a he had a almost a hate uh, for Christians because uh, he would uh, arrest them, he would throw them in jail, and even if you remember, uh, he was there when Stephen was stoned. But things changed in his life when he accepted Christ into his life, and so when he looks there and we see what's happened and and you know we can we can see that uh paul to me paul never looked back okay uh immediately if you'll read the word of god uh he started preaching the gospel and there was an indication that you know we're talking hours or maybe a day or two uh not you know not a long period of time and even the time that he spent away uh, from you know uh, Jerusalem, uh, he he was teaching. He was being taught uh, by our by our God and our Savior. So things changed in his life. It was a dra- just drastic, drastic change. And when we think of gains and losses, I don't know about you, uh, but you know, I think of the American way. All right, every everybody, and and again, I'm not saying everybody totally 100%, but I'm simply saying, you know, we look at what we have and we look at what we don't have. And a lot of times it comes down to what's the most important thing to you. And even in our, I'm I'm trying to, you know, give an application here of how we see it sometimes, even though I don't think this was Paul's issue, but I think it is our issue because we live in such a uh, you know, a country that prosperous, 
Uh, you know, when you think about it, you know, we can, we can drive just about anywhere we want to go. Uh, we can look in our pantries and just, you know, if we don't like it, we go and buy something else. We eat out a lot, and we're very prosperous. And so when it talks about, you know, losses and gains, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, go with me there. I want to remind us what uh, the Word of God says. 1 Timothy 6.6, 6. now godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay, and of course we're talking a Christian perspective. But the almighty dollar, I, folks, I know people that just live for money. Okay, I've, I've seen people, and I know people that, is, you know, they'll, they'll be flying somewhere, and as soon as they get off the plane, they do, go to a screen to find out what the money market's doing. And what's going on there. I've seen people do that, you see, and that's, you know, you know, the money, I know you have to pay your bills, is what I'm trying to say, but sometimes we just as Americans overdo that. So now godliness, being Christ-like, with contentment. Folks, we would have a lot more peace in our life if we would focus more on what we have than what we don't have. Amen. And so, in our own lives, we need to realize that you think about co contentment, it, it's just having that peace of God in our lives. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Okay, and I've heard of people, you know, want to be buried in their Cadillacs, you know, they want to be buried in their fur coats and stuff like that, and, you know, it's just going to rot. It, you know, you can't take it with you, all right? And it's certainly not going to be there in heaven. And having food and clothing, with uh, these things we should be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in dis uh, destruction and perdition. Uh, they've done these studies on people that win the lottery. And, and I'm just telling you, 70, I believe it was 75% of the time, those who win it about three years later, have nothing to show for. Why? Because, you know, their whole focus on spending, spending, I want, I want, I want, I want. And we need to understand, let me put it this way, folks. You know, money cannot buy happiness, and money cannot give you joy. Now, again, if you, if, if, you know, there's nothing wrong with having money. Don't, don't get me wrong here. There's nothing wrong. If you make it honestly, there's nothing wrong with that. But it should not be our focus. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. There's been preachers that go down because of money. There's been evangelists that go down because of money. There's been politicians that go down because of money. And folks, I am telling you, your attitude about money is important to your Christian walk. So we see here in this, you know, this first part, the gains and losses, Paul is basically saying, I've lived both ways, okay? I've been on the good side of things. I was respected, all right? I had money. But when it comes down to that in my relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, I do like the, you know, my Bible says it is rubbish, okay? Well, folks, we know what rubbish is. It's garbage or trash, all right? And, and again, I, I'm not, you know, trashing money, but I'm saying if that's all you think about, if it's all about making the almighty dollar, all right, it's, if it's about seeing how much money I can keep, and even in our own lives, folks, you know, God gives us blessings so that we can be blessing to others. So we need to do that in our own lives. And you know what the truth is? We have things money can't buy Amen. as a Christian. Money can't buy salvation, folks. It can't do it. It can't buy love. Now, you'll hang around people till they run out of money. <laughs> okay, I understand that. But money cannot buy love. Money can't buy peace. I mean, it, a lot of times, folks, it makes people miserable. They worry about it. They worry about money. 
And then what I said before, money cannot buy joy. Matter of fact, Matthew chapter 6. Look at Matthew 6, and we know the teachings of Jesus. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in mammon. Now, some people think the mammon is the world, but I truly believe in this instant, mammon, he's talking about money. You, you have to serve God. You cannot put money before God. One of uh, Jesus' own disciples, what was his issue? It was money. What did Jesus do? Sold, I mean, what did Judas do? Sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. All right? And, and again, you know, he's the one that spoke up that time and said, you know, this lady, she just wasted. You know, she put all this perfume. That's expensive stuff. And she just broke the whole bottle on Jesus. Why? Because she wanted to give Jesus something special. She wanted to give Jesus her best. All right? And he's back there saying, well, that could have been given to the poor. Well, that should have told you something right there. All right? Again, folks, money has ruined a whole lot of people. And we truly, we truly sometimes gain uh, more than we lose. I, I mean, when we get saved, it's what I'm trying to say. We gain everything, folks. We, find, we have peace of mind. We have contentment. We have, you know, salvation. And, and sometimes, you know, people look at it like, you know, you had a, you had a great job. Uh, I was working for Midwest Showcase, uh, a, a furniture store in Lawton, Oklahoma, when I was 21 years old. And I, was a, I started out in the warehouse, then I went to the floor, and then I was a salesman. I worked all the way through college in that. And when I told my boss that I was going to go and be a youth minister, and he, they went to church, their whole family went to church, he said, are you kidding me? They don't pay you nothing to be a youth minister. And he asked me, he goes, how much money are you going to make? And I said, it doesn't matter. And he said, no, no, tell me how much money you can make. And I told him, and he laughed in my face. He did. And folks, I, I'm just telling you, it, I was really, even as you know, a young Christian and getting into the youth ministry, I just didn't understand that. And folks, I know with all my heart, you know, you know, money is just, at that point in my life, man, I was just wanting to surrender to God and money was not an issue with us. Matter of fact, I remember when we got married, we were in a trailer. We rented a trailer for $125 a month and was kind of sweating whether we were going to make it or not. But do you know, even in that early times in Laura and I's life, we, we just remember some good times in those times. There's nothing wrong. And folks, I have learned God will take care of you. Amen. He'll take care of you. Right. And I'll just say this. When I left Cameron Baptist Church, I was making a lot more money than I was going to make at that furniture store. Not because that, that's what I, I mean, I wasn't choosing it because I thought that's what would happen. But God blessed me for my stand and, and my testimony there. So we see past earthly things. And then there's past personal righteousness. Number two, look at verse nine. And being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith, in Christ, the righteousness uh, which is from God by faith. And so before being a, you know, uh, a man of the law, being under you know, one of the best teachers of the law, you know, he had respect. But folks, he didn't know Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. The righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees were all on the outside. They had the robes. They were the ones that prayed in public. They were the ones that, you know, I, I never can, you know, I, I still think of when the two came in to pray, uh, the temple to pray, and, you know, the publican, and, you know, and, and uh, you know, the righteous, the righteous, and, you know, he just basically prayed. The righteous just said, uh, I, I thank God that I'm not like that guy. 
you know, how pompous. I, I just can't imagine someone being that arrogant in a temple. But yet the sinner just crawled over in the corner and got on his knees and just said, hey, God, I know, you know, I, I'm, I'm nothing here. But sometimes, folks, that's the simple prayer of a person reaching out for God. I mean, God hears those prayers, folks. He hears them, and he answers those prayers. So Paul was basically saying, I had righteousness, but it was of the law. I thought the law was going to make me, uh, you know, perfect, and the law was the thing. And matter of fact, he gives, uh, you know, kind of his spiritual resume in Philippians chapter 3. Go back to verse uh, verse 3, Philippians 3.3. 3. For we are of the circumcision, and talking about the Jew, who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Jesus Christ, and have no confidence in the flesh, though we might have confidence in the flesh. He's saying everything changed when I got saved. I was living, you know, for my own righteousness. But when I found Christ, everything changed. And it says, if anyone else thinks he has have confidence in his flesh, I more so. And listen to this, circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee. What's he given them? His spiritual resume, his as a Jewish a teacher and rabbi, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. And looking out at his life, or looking from the outside, you would think he had everything. He had respect. He had an education. He had, uh, you know, a good, a good income coming. But he just says, hey, all that stuff means nothing to me now that I know Jesus Christ. And folks, uh, you know, there's, there's times when I'm witnessed in people, and, you know, they kind of give me their uh, spiritual resume sometimes. And I don't know about you, but uh, discernment is a good thing, but sometimes, you know, you, know, you just, you, your head, I'm trying to say, you know what they're saying is not true, okay? And, and uh, so, you know, there are people that, uh, say, you know, I know I'm saved. I'm, I know, you know, this, and we go through this conversation, and in my heart of hearts, I'm thinking, and, you know, I, I just, I'm just not buying this. And you know what happens sometimes when, when that happens? I get a chance later on to go back to them and to just sit down, and a lot of times I'll start with this point blank question. It happened to me just a two weeks ago. If you were to die tonight or today, would you go to heaven? And here's what that person said. That question slapped me in the face. Okay? And what is that? Oh, that's conviction of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Paul was saying. Paul thought, hey, I had a good spiritual resume. I was religious. But there's a huge difference between religion and righteousness, folks. There's a huge difference. He's saying here, I'll put my uh, resume, I'll put my, all my transcripts, I'll put everything up against yours. And then he used it in the verse earlier, and here's what all that is. It's rubbish. It's rubbish. And I'm glad I got an education, and I'm glad I went to college, I'm glad I graduated from Oklahoma Baptist University. I, I am. I'm glad I did that. I think it made me a better person and a better preacher. But still, you know, you don't have to have a degree to be spirit-filled. You don't have to have a degree to get behind a pulpit and preach the Word of God. You think of some of these old country preachers that I'm just telling you, they're out there, they're running about 50 in church, but yet every Sunday they get up and they preach the Word of God, being faithful to God. So Paul is simply saying, when I compared the two, my own righteousness with the righteousness of God, there was something greatly 
missing, greatly missing, and that was faith in Jesus Christ. It says in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Oh, folks, that's what salvation is, folks. That's what discipleship is, getting to know God. And that's what Paul did. Man, he got to know God, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. Think about it, resurrection power, all right? A dead man coming to life. Is that not the Romans chapter 3 and Romans chapter 6? I was dead in my trespasses and sin. All right, I wasn't even on life support, folks. I was dead, but yet God breathed his life into me. And the fellowship of his sufferings, Anybody knew about suffering? It was Paul being conformed to his death. What is he talking about? Dying to self. Folks, we have to die to self. And it says, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. And I'm just telling you, Paul got it. All right? I truly believe with all my heart, he was one of the greatest Christians, one of the greatest soul winners, one of the greatest per- uh you know, uh, church planners, and one of the greatest, uh, you know, you know, missionaries that ever walked the face of our earth. And he's just basically saying, man, you can have the world. I was out in it, and I wasn't content with that. And so we see past earthly things. We see uh, past personal righteousness. Uh, Hebrews 12, there's two verses here. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, also since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which easily ensnares us. And folks, you know, that, that loss and gain thing, you know, sin is out there. The world is out there. And we as Christians, we need to stay as far away from sin as we can. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, And folks, here is the key, looking unto Jesus. Folks, if you will just keep your eyes on Jesus, you'll run the race. I ran track when I was younger, and, you know, our track coach, one of the things he said, you know, from the start, your head's down, you listen for the gun, and when you raise up, you look in your lane and only in your lane and you run as hard as you possibly can. And folks, I think that's true of the Apostle Paul's life. I even think, and again, I I don't know if I'll ask him this or not, but I want to ask him, Paul, did you run like that, run like a deer? Did you run crazy because of your past? Okay, and I, I don't have an answer for that, but I'm talking about what one man did in his time, you know, when there weren't cars, you know, there wasn't modern technology, and all this, what he did in there, just to- at that just totally amazed me. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. For a long time, I didn't understand the joy in being crucified. I mean, I really did. I struggled that, with that for years. And then, I don't know, it's been several years ago, it clicked for me. And you know what the joy was in the cross? He was going home. He was going back to heaven. He ran his race while he was here on earth. He was going back. And folks, he's the only person that started in heaven, came to earth, and ended back in heaven. Nobody else has done that. He run his race with joy that was set before him and endured the cross, despising shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And folks, I believe Paul had that attitude about him. I believe Paul kept his eyes on Jesus. So we see the past earthly things, the past right, right personal things. Now look at the past fears and failures. Back in our text, Philippians, verse 12. Not that I have already attained or already perfected. Folks, nobody's perfect, okay? Nobody's perfect. 
the Apostle Paul wasn't perfect. Always used the example of him, you know, and Barnabas. They were arguing over John Mark, you know. What did Paul say? Ah, he, he, he went home. You know, we don't need people like him. We don't need this, you know. And, and again, I'm not judging him. I'm just simply saying, Barnabas, what was his name? Son of what? Encouragement. But do you know Paul did kind of admit it when he said, later on when he said, hey, bring John Mark with you when you come. It, 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 he's good. He's, he's good at it. All right? Not that I have already attained. Uh, am, I, am I already perfect? But I press on that I may hold of that which Christ Jesus has laid a hold on me. I'm telling you folks, one of the keys in your Christian life is to press on. Okay? Sometimes it gets tough. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you're physically drained. Sometimes you're spiritually drained. Sometimes you're emotionally drained when you deal with people. And here's the deal, spiritual warfare. See, Satan wants to discourage you. Satan wants to do everything. He'll throw roadblocks up at you. He'll throw detours at you. He'll use your family against you. He'll do anything that he can do to distract you and have you not running the race set for, before you. But he says, I press on that I may lo- lay hold for that which Jesus Christ laid hold of me. And folks, it's so important that we do that. We are not perfect. Only Jesus was perfect. We have not arrived spiritually. There's not, I hope, there's not one here that would raise their hand and say, hey, I, you know, I, I've arrived. There's nothing else I need to conquer, nothing else I need to strive for in my Christian life. If you say that's true, then I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to question that. All right? We can all do better. And we are. We are going to fail. Okay? But there's two things I, I said here, past fears and past failures. You cannot less let past uh, failures put fear in your life. Think about people who invented things. You know, if you've studied inventions, all right? I mean, they failed hundreds of times. What, the Oval, the Wright brothers? And a lot of these folks just failed, failed the first time. But they just got up and kept going. All right, and sometimes... Satan does knock us down, folks. He just knocks us down. What do you do? You get up. You get up and you get back in the race. Now here's, I've said all that for this. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Do you realize Satan wants you to live in the past He wants to remind you of how sorry you were, how sorry you are, and how sorry you're probably going to be. He wants to discourage you. But folks, forgetting, and and I jotted this down, true forgetting is also true forgiveness. Because I've heard people say, you know, I've forgiven them, but I can't forget it. The thing you have to understand about forgetting, you can't block things. You can't just erase things out of your mind. But what you can do is determine in your heart that you're not going to let a past situation keep you from victory in Jesus. And that's what Satan is. He'll just throw these things at you. And you know when he likes to do it the most? I don't know about you, but when I either am trying to go to sleep Sometimes it's in the middle of the night, and sometimes it's as soon as I wake up. You can't do that. You have failed. You forgot to, and he'll just, he'll just throw these roadblocks. And folks, here's the deal about the past. You realize you can't change one thing in your past? What you did at 1 o'clock today, what is it called? Your past. What is it called? History. You know the difference between history and his story? You get it? Folks, God enables us. God can get us through anything. 
God can change anyone. 2 Corinthians 5.17, you've heard me quote it many, many times. Many, many times you've heard me quote it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Now, I will say this, you've got to watch this. Them old things sometimes try to crop up. And what you need to say to the devil is, that's in my past. That's in my past. I'm living for Jesus today. And folks, he hates the name of Jesus. I promise you, he absolutely hates the name of Jesus. So it says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I pressed towards the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Have you noticed that's the second time he said, I press I keep hearing this from senior adults in our church. You know what they tell me? Being old ain't for sissies. I mean, I couldn't tell you how many. That bill, I could just go through the list of people that have told me, you know, that ain't for sissies. Let me tell you this. Being a Christian ain't for sissies either. Folks, it's tough. Okay? It's not all beds and roses. It's not all blessings all the time. The road is uphill sometimes. The weather is beating on you sometimes. Your age. But folks, the thing, and here's why I love senior adults, they have wisdom. Okay? They have wisdom. All right, why? And they've been through the storms of life. They've been at the grave sites, and they've been at coffins. They've been to where in hospitals where a doctor will say, there's nothing else we can do. And folks, that's what we need to draw from. We need to draw from the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. So I press toward the goal of the prize of the upper calling in Christ Jesus. And do you know what most people say when they look at the prize of the upper calling? You know what the natural thing to say is? Heaven. Heaven. Well, folks, that's a gimme. We're going to heaven. They, they, there's no debate. There's, there's nothing. I mean, I'm not downplaying it one bit because we're going, and I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. If he came tonight, man, I'd be ready to go. But, folks, we're talking about all this is talking about living in your life right now. Do you know what we need to press towards, and do you know what the prize is? It's being like Jesus. We, as we stay here on earth, our goal should be, I need to be like Jesus. Okay? Because people are watching us everywhere we go. People are reacting to our reactions. People are reacting to what we say. People are reacting to where we go. And folks, there's eyes on us everywhere we go. It's like my grandkids, you know. I love my kids very, very much. But when God made grandkids, they're just something. He, he, I don't know what he did, but he, I don't know how he did it. You think when your kids, and, and I still love my kids, I would die for my kids. But there's just something about grandkids that you don't want to let them down. You want to be the example. And folks, I just could not imagine all right, me making a decision that would destroy my life and destroy my ministry. Keeping your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Two more verses and then I'm done. Hebrews 10. These are people that can't forgive themselves. Okay? And there are people, folks, I have counseled many a person, you are not going forward until you forgive yourself. People around you has forgiven you. Maybe a boss has forgiven you. Maybe a spouse has forgiven you, but you cannot forgive yourself. Verse 16, Hebrews 10, 16. This is the covenant that I make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. 
The Word of God. He's not talking about just the Ten Commandments. He's talking about the Word of God. That's why it's so important that we study the Word of God. We read the Word of God. We apply the Word of God. We memorize the Word of God. And here it is. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. There's two kinds of attitudes that you can have, and the first one's not right. Well, I'm going to do this. I know it's wrong, but my Bible says God's going to forgive me. All right? That is not the attitude that we need to have. The attitude is when we see it, that we confess our sins, okay? We repent of our sins. We say, God, I'm sorry. God, I was wrong. God, please forgive me. Please forgive me of my sin. And God will forgive you. Because you've done it. I've done it. I've done this more than once. I'll sin one day, and I'll ask God to forgive me of that sin. And then I'll go to sleep that night, and hear that, there it is again. God, would you forgive me of that sin? And then I'll wake up in the morning, and I'll ask him. And finally, when I listen to God, you know what he says to me? According to this verse, I forgave you the first time. And folks, because God gives forgiveness to us, we need to learn to forgive others. You will sleep better. You will feel better. You will be more content. You will have more joy in your life if you will forgive others of their trespasses. And, and folks, that's what the, the disciples' prayer is. Okay, forgive and you will be forgiven. In the last scripture, John chapter 8, and y'all know this story, you know, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, they're always trying to mess with Jesus, and they bought, brought a woman to him caught in adultery, and, you know, they were trying to put him on the spot, teacher, you know, what do you say? You know, and basically, you know, they were trying to test him. <laughs> I love what Jesus did. He stooped down and just wrote in the, wrote in the ground and kind of just ignored them for, for a minute, you know, and... You know, in my life, I do try to ignore ignorance in some people, folks. All right? I just don't engage with them. Don't play the game with them. All right? But look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her. Boy, I bet it got quiet around there. And then... Notice what happened. He did some more writing in the dirt, and they started going out one by one. Why did the elderly go out first? I told you earlier, they've got wisdom. They get it faster than young people do. Look at verse 10. And when Jesus has raised himself up, he saw no one but the woman. He said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I commit, uh, condemn you. Go and sin no more. Well, folks, Satan keeps our sin in front of us to where we can't forgive ourselves and we don't have the freedom to be, you know, and, and you think about it, you're only saved by God's mercy and grace. And again, it's no license to sin. I am not promoting a license to sin. I'm saying if you truly repent, you need to forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. Tomorrow's another day. Tomorrow's another day. And that's what he, he was telling. I mean, he told her, you know, it, I mean, he, he knew who she was. She, he knew what she did. The woman at the well, same thing. All right? We look at those these two girls as... Big sinners, huge sinners. He said, you've been married five times, and the guy you're living with, he ain't, he, you're not married to him anyway. He didn't condemn her. He didn't call her a name. All right? He told her how she could get living water. Folks, it's that living water that has saved us. So I want to encourage you tonight as we 
leave this place. Quit living in the past. We've all been hurt. I would say most of us have been hurt at church. Somewhere, somehow, we've all been hurt. But folks, let me give you some, some advice. Let it go. It's not worth it. Do you realize that you let people occupy, occupy a space in your head when you will not forgive people? They're taking up room that could be used for something fruitful. And so we need to let it go. And I'm telling you, every time I preach a sermon like this, someone, you know, and again, I know there's not a huge crowd tonight, but if there was, if it was a Sunday morning, somebody, before I left that place, they'd come up to me and say, Brother Mike, you don't know. You, you don't know what I've been through. Well, I know what Jesus went through. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, thank you for just your word. Thank you that we don't have to live in the past. And God, I pray that we could just get by this. God, we'd be so much happier. We would have the joy of the Lord in our lives. We could overcome those fears. And God, there's no such thing as a failure God, you see potential in everyone. So God, I pray that you would just help us to press on, to keep our eyes on Jesus. I know you can't I know we can't change the past, but we sure can change the future. And God, I look at the future and man, we got a great future ahead of us. God, thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for always being there. Thank you for your word of God which encourages us in the faith. And God, I just pray, Lord, that we would just look to you for everything in life. And I pray that we would be that example of people that have overcome. And I pray that we would be overcomers in our own lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.